Well, we're here in the lobby of the Scotia Bank Center at our conference on Fatima, the path to peace, and I'm pleased to have with us today, in the midst of her busy schedule, Suzanne Pearson. You worked on Capitol Hill for many years, and since then you've uh, adopted a second career as a scholar and researcher on various subjects, many of them related to the Catholic Church. Right. And you're here today to uh, talk about clues to the third secret from Father Malachi Martin. Now you yourself acknowledge, and many people ha have raised this objection, that he is a very controversial figure. What do we do with, with Father Malachi Martin before we get into this subject? How well, do we approach... In my talk I said that I cannot prove anything. I knew him the last four years of his life. Uh, everything I knew about him was so good. His kindness, we met in New York to go to lunch and he saw a, a person who looked quite poor on the street. He'd invite that person into lunch too, set her down at another table and order her anything she wanted. And uh, he, he wanted, his big mission in life was to bring people into the Catholic Church, to make them more fervent Catholics, to lead them to the traditional Mass, uh, to Our Lady, to Christ. I mean, he had, he had such an overriding motivation to do that, that he went on the radio, for instance, and if people were invited to call in with their questions, and more times than not, he would say, write to me. And he would give the address, and people could write. And I know people in New York who were personally aided by him to get out of a, a wayward life and right back into the church and all the way to the traditional mass. And this happened with atheists and with fallen away Catholics and with just lukewarm Catholics. It's quite amazing because there are people all over who could tell a similar story. Well, you know, I, I've met the, I met the man and there were things about him that raised questions, but on the other hand, he did seem to have information that oh, other did. people did not have access to. Now, the problem is which, which is fictional and which is true information. He wrote that Romana Clef, what was the name of that novel he wrote? Windswept House. Yes. Windswept House had a lot of things in it that actually came to pass, and maybe he was just good at guessing, or maybe he actually had inside information. But in any event, it's useful, I think, to look at what Father Malachi Martin says to see if it's consistent with what we know from other sources. Right. And I think that's probably what you did and you're going to do in your talk. Right. Uh, first of all, to clarify about the sources of his knowledge, he had several, for, he was very well educated, but like many of the scholars here, it went beyond that. Some people have a greater capacity than others to, to assimilate all that information. He spoke 25 languages, so he had access to people all over the world who could give him, feed him information. He, he was constantly in contact with people all over the world. Um, he was a very much a Vatican insider according to what he says, but he seems to be too in the things that he knows. And I spoke about Fatima today, but when I was interviewed by this other organization about him, they didn't ask me about Fatima at all. He, he, he knew about a lot of things that went on in the Vatican, and not just now, but but all the way back since uh, he went to Rome. Um, he had that source of information, but then on the other hand, he explained to me one time that people, when they converse with someone, most people are listening to what they hear, and they may also, if you're present in the same room, read some body language. But he said there are actually about eight ways that people communicate, and if you learn, you can pick those up. Like, uh, I know that he told me that I had a certain amount of that sense, which is true in the sense that I can tell when people are not telling me the truth. I can always tell. That doesn't mean I know what it is, but I can tell right away. And and a few other things that he, apparently there's a lot of that in life that if you practice you can learn a lot more and I think that's conveyed in his novels as well because there's a lot of nuances in these characters and a lot of what they were really thinking and what they actually said and what it really meant a third, th a third thing that it really meant and so I think he did um, assimilate information and convey it on many levels. 
Now, there's no question he was an impressive man and his gifts are, are, are undeniable. And as I say, if he says something that is consistent with what we already know, at the very least it provides a confirmation mm -hmm, of what mm -hmm. we already know. Now, you, you mentioned in your talk three things about his insights into the message of Fatima. The first of which is that Fatima is a defining event for the church in the third millennium. Why the third millennium? I suppose because uh, Our Lady's requests were not met by the end of the second one. Okay. Now, and when you say defining event, for people who don't know anything about the message of Fatima, explain to them why Fatima could be a defining event in the first place. First of all, because the uh, tremendous earth-shaking happenings that went on in the 20th century, uh, most of them could have been avoided if we had listened to Our Lady of Fatima. If uh, Pius XI had listened, he would have consecrated Russia as she requested, and we would not have had World War II. We would not have had all the evils that flowed from World War II. We would not have all of Eastern Europe under communism, uh, all of the upheavals in Southeast Asia, Russia spreading her errors throughout the world. But it doesn't only mean geopolitically, it also means her ideas. And so all of the atheistic, Maliki used to say, the essence of Marxism and all that is, is this world only, only what you see, touch, hear. Uh, and that's the, that error is only one of many that has gone throughout the world in the years that we wasted the opportunity to end that whole process. And because he died in 1999, so he could see that not much was going to get done in the next few months, and it was going to be the third millennium. And so I think that's why he said third millennium. And, and Phantom is still very much with us. And uh, as others have noted at this conference, it's with us because the popes themselves will not let it go. Now Pope Francis has had his entire pontificate consecrated to Our Lady of Fatima by the bishops of Portugal, and he will attempt a third consecration of the world but not Russia, on eh. October 13th of this year. Right, I, I was so disappointed to hear. But I do have great hopes for Pope Francis because he, he has been in touch with Father Gruner over the years and supports his cause. And my guess is that Pope Francis fully intended to consecrate Russia and when he became Pope he found out why all the others couldn't. And uh, he's affected by the same thing is what I think. Do you think there's any likelihood that the October 13 ceremony will become a well, consecration I think it of would, Russia? I think it would be hard because he has to establish some kind of a mechanism to ascertain whether the majority or, or most of the bishops actually did it with him. I mean, he has, to, he has to make it known to them ahead of time and establish some way that they can record their doing so. It's because otherwise, if only a fourth of the bishops actually did it, but many of them said they did, but we don't know what they said in their own diocese, maybe Our Lady wouldn't consider it done. Suzanne, what do you say to the objection that, well, you know, the events of the 20th century have happened, all of these chastisements have taken place, we had World War II, the spread of Russia's errors, the establishment of world communism, uh, and that's all in the past, so whatever relevance Fatima had, that relevance no longer concerns us because it's basically a done deal. So it's too late for the consecration, why bother? Well that couldn't be farther from the truth because obviously the plan of the enemies of our Lord and His Church is to uh, gain the whole world and take it away from the Kingdom of Christ. And they used communism as another friend of mine in Washington DC who's written many books has said Our Lady never said communism by name. She said Russia. And I think that's quite significant because we cannot uh, limit the, her, her concerns to the parameters of what was communism. It, it, it just doesn't fit. Malachi Martin said that the step, he said as long as we don't do the chastisement, as long as we don't do the consecration of Russia, things will follow along 
on a fateful timetable. And at every step of the way, Russia is the ratchet, not just during the time of communism. Russia will move the agenda forward. And much evil was done while Russia was the Soviet Union, but much evil in the world continues. One of the things, uh, the errors of Russia would produce wars, with uh, revolutions, they would keep stimulating further conflicts, which continue, we can all see. Right now we're in the midst of the Syrian crisis. Right. Russia is uh, jockeying for position with the United States, and the superpowers are arrayed around this tiny nation, and we have seen with the two great wars of the 20th century that events in little nations trigger the great wars. Now we find that Russia is exploiting this supposed diplomatic slip by John Kerry suggesting that uh, if Syria will uh, turn over its chemical weapons to international control, then the, uh, the coming senseless bombardment of Syria can be averted. But at the same time, Russia is supplying armaments to Iran, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, which is triggering outcries from Israel. So the pressure cooker of the Middle, Middle East seems to be reaching the boiling point and the point where it's going to explode. And Russia's at the center of it. And Russia's at the center of it. And we can expect that until Our Lady's wishes are carried out, in one way or another, Russia will be at the center of it. There's a place in my talk where, I, where he lists uh, the various ways that there is a big geopolitical change about to take place in the world. And Russia is its womb, he said. Russia will be the instigator. Russia will be the source of uh, disorientation and confusion in the world. There are many ways that Russia will move this agenda forward until, until we uh, bring about the consecration of that nation, at which time Our Lady will use it in the opposite way, to be a trigger for furthering the kingdom of Christ. Well, you know, I, I, I've, I've had my doubts about Martin as an authoritative source, but here again, if this is what his prediction was, we see that he either had good information that others were, were, were not able to access, or he was just a good guesser, because clearly Russia is still operating as the womb of turmoil in the world. Yes, indeed. Or at least is at the very center of it. Uh, along with the United States of America. And you will find if you look at other subjects, he was way prescient about, about the uh, pedophile crisis, as they called it. Uh, he was talking about that back in the 80s, at the beginning of John Paul II's pontificate. What was he saying about that? That it was going to cause great trouble for the church. He had found out about bishops all over the United States. I don't know what he knew. A priest, bishops who were allowing such activity in their seminaries or among their prelates and, and putting them from one place to another so as not to create a scandal in the church and that this was going to erupt and, and uh, all sorts of, but mostly the facet of, of how displeasing it is to the Lord and what an outrage it is to Christ and to offer the Eucharist when you're carrying on like some of them were. And uh, this kind of thing, of course, disturbed him greatly. And he, he was very much into the spiritual side of things. And by that, people right away think of his book, Hostage to the Devil, which was about exorcism. But actually, in the years that I knew him, he talked probably more about the good angels and how helpful they are to mankind and if we only paid he used this term he says you have to cultivate the angels you have to cultivate your guardian angel by offering a hail mary in his honor and by doing and by inviting him into your life and that the angels would would help you and so i think he claimed that a not a lot of the insights he got were from his constant cultivation of the angels as prayer, not, not like psychics would, as prayer. You quote uh, Father Martin for another proposition, uh, that the third secret in particular is an either-or proposition and that now we are living in the or. 
of that proposition. What do you mean by that? Yes. The, what do he mean by that? The third, uh, the third secret being part of the secret as a whole, ever since the request of 1929, that now is the time, uh, in a sense was an either or, because as long as the Pope did not consecrate Russia, evils from Russia continued to spread. But it looks like at the beginning of the third part of the secret, uh, there was another push to finally get this consecration because this was the time when the secret would be revealed and as he said that much could be done to alleviate what was coming if we knew the secret. So he should have revealed that and he should have consecrated Russia and because he did not certain punishments would follow. The either was that the peace of the world would come then, instead of being postponed till the third millennium. But besides that, there would be punishments. And the spiritual punishments began right after 1960. We could see the church uh, falling apart. Well, it's obvious something went radically wrong beginning right around that year. Indeed and it did. M Malachi Martin described it as like uh, electricity, electrical shutdown in a city. That's an interesting metaphor. Why don't you explain that a bit? Yes, after the Pope refused uh, to release the secret and to consecrate Russia in 1960, Malachi Martin said, God has withdrawn grace. And that would be a pretty good explanation of what happened to the church, except that it seems like a sabotaging thing for God to do of his own will. But uh, I think what it really means is that graces were so widely refused and it was a continuing process. And here's what he said. He said it was like electricity flowing through a city, the flow of grace through the mystical body of Christ. And when the Pope, first of all, refused to do what Our Lady Queen of Heaven had asked, he lost the immense graces that would have come to the church from that, and he was punished by being given less grace than he had. And so as priests and bishops followed him and did things that would not please our Lord, especially with the liturgy and other parts of the Catholic faith, uh, less and less grace is in the treasury of the church. And Malachi compared and more that. And more decadence in the church as a yes. result. And he compared that to electricity flowing through a city. And he said, like one time in New York, there was a power outage and everything came to a halt. It was like that in the church with convents closing and priests leaving and mass decline, mass attendance declining. It was like the power went out, just like electricity went out. I'm thinking of the, uh, the Pope, Pope Benedict's admission in uh, his uh, address of February 14, 2013 about a virtual council which he ascribes to the mass media but which in fact was the council as implemented by the hierarchy of the church and he admitted that this virtual council which he tries to distinguish from the real council had caused so many disasters his words so many calamities uh, seminaries closed convents closed the liturgy banalized He's describing something that has actually never happened to the church in her history. That's there right. have been heresies, such as the Arian heresy, but that was one heresy that infected a large part of the church. That's right. What he is describing is a collapse of the church in many departments. Absolutely. That has to be without precedent. Oh, it does. Yeah. And it describes what, uh, it's a downward spiral. Like when there's less grace, there's less virtue, in turn, that wins less grace, and it's a downward spiral until the Pope finally does that consecration the way it ought to be done. Well, the, the curious thing is, it's not as if the Popes have said, oh, come on, it was a consecration of the world. That was in 1981. Oh, okay, there was another one in 1984. That's enough. Please, let's forget Fatima. No, they keep bringing it up again. They do, and, and particularly Pope John Paul II. It was obvious that he really wanted to do it. It was obvious. He Meaning scheduled, the consecration of Russia. Yes, he, he scheduled three such events, at least. 1982, 1984, and 2000. Uh, he 
he wanted to each time and I was told by people uh, that at times he was talked out of it right at the last minute as he was going to the podium. Yeah, he said things after the 1984 ceremony to the effect of we have done whatever we could within our human powers. Uh, in other words, my hands are tied. And I did said, the best I could. I consecrated the world. And he said Our Lady accepts it, which is true. She accepted, just like with Pius the Twelfth. Uh, when he did his consecration of the world, Lucia said that that, will, that pleased Our Lady, it will ma win many graces, but not the promises she made about Russia. Yeah, she, she, she accepts it for what it's worth. Exactly. Now, uh, have, heaven will not uh, uh, fail to reward a good deed done in the honor of Our Lady, but that's not what she asked for. She asked for the consecration of Russia. And, and now, strangely enough, we're going to get a third consecration of the world on October 13th. And my guess is because they get so desperate for the little graces they will get that they do that much. And it's not as if they're saying Fatima is, is over and done with. No, no, we're going to do another consecration of the world. But, the, but the, the mystery here is why not simply mention Russia? Why do you think there's been this almost preternatural impediment to the mention of a single word, Russia, and all of these substitute ceremonies that we've seen. First of all, and I say this in there, I think there's something in the secret that tells us why, and as soon as the new pope reads the secret, he finds out why, and that's why he too doesn't do it. That's what I think. I think there's a threat. Not a personal threat against the pope, a threat against the whole church. Hmm, what could that be? We can only speculate. Oh, it's in there. <clears throat> what, uh, what do you think it is? It's some, it's some absolute destruction. Uh, I talk about scalar energy in there, which I'm guessing Malachi meant by some of the things he told me, but he might not have. There could be others. What is scalar energy? It's uh, an energy that, that uh, has uh, compressed time into uh, wave energy waves that can be extremely powerful. These waves are free, they can be sent into land to produce earthquakes, they can be sent in t uh, across the whole, uh, to the other side of the world to produce a volcano, and all of a sudden people are going to think they've been hit by an act of God where it was really a man-made weapon, man manipulating nature. Because Malachi said, that they keep prophesying all of these uh, cataclysmic events regarding nature, tsunamis, earthquakes, etc. He said, some of these things are in the secret, but when these things begin to happen, remember, it is not nature and it is not God. Well, I know that uh, weapons, weapons development programs are underway to actually harness nature to weaponize nature, exactly to weaponize the earthquake right to, right right to uh, to weaponize obviously pathogens of various kinds yes and and also to use uh, sonic energy yes to create standing waves absolutely uh, that would uh, affect uh, the ground and also to use sonic energy to basically turn people into zombies we just read about yes, that yes i read about in that the too. press recently yes to uh, what, that to too. what uh, shut off the nervous systems of people and mm -hmm. turn them into walking dead exactly to refer to a television show that's that's quite popular and these are mainstream news accounts talking about these weapons that are in development right now but nevertheless no matter how much of this we talk about there is something in the secret that's never been guessed yet by anyone trying to predict that's that's another thing well, we're just about out of time, but uh, your, your talk is quite provocative and it, it indicates the absolute necessity of getting to the bottom of this, the meaning of the third secret, the vision that they gave us, the film, as it were, yes. without a soundtrack. Exactly. We need to find out what the soundtrack of this terrifying movie is so we can figure out what happened. And I thank you for your contribution to uh, what Antonio Sochi has called, regarding Fatima, Operation Truth. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you and God Pleasure. bless you. God bless you.
I have come to warn the faithful to amend their lives and ask pardon for their sins. They must not continue to offend our Lord, who is already deeply offended. Final vision on October 13, 1917. Our Lady silently held out the scapular, a gesture which indicates that she wants everyone to wear it. <laughs> 